Now we are looking at part two, and hopefully this lecture is as good as last week, even better. Now I've got quite a number of slides to look at now. It's 7.40, we're meant to do an hour, and I would like to introduce the subject of, of standing stone circles in Britain. Now we're looking at the comparison of eight sites in four different areas of Britain. So we look at two sites in Orkney, we look at two sites in Cornwall, two sites in Cymru, and two sites in Cumbria. Now, most of these localities I have visited, but one or two I haven't. And the one or two at the end that I haven't, I'm gonna leave it to you to do a little bit more research all by yourselves. So, um, we're going to, first of all, go to a wonderful part of the world. Now, the first place we're going to actually visit will be Orkney, but we're not going to be visiting the Standing Stones of Stennis yet. And I will not be telling you about the experience that Pat had at the Ring of Stennis. Bill knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this this um, image in front of you is going to be the first site that we visit. Now, I used to live in Cumbria, and one of the things I can remember from Cumbria is that it's got a number of stone circles. Now, the most famous of these stone circles in Cumbria is the one at Castle Rig. Now, I know some of you have been to Castle Rig with me um, when we had our wonderful Hadrian's Wall trip on the way back. Now, this site in front of us is known as Swineside. And I've not been to this one, actually, but I've been to some of the stone circles nearby. And if you if you start looking at this image, the first thing that you can make out is that it's not exactly on the top of a hill. Lots of these um, stone circles are in the hearts of natural amphitheatres. So the place that we're going to actually visit first, and if I get my little, um, this, this is a site known as Swineside. Now I used to live in that little town called Millam for my sins. Um, and when I used to go out with my little daughter and my little son, um, we used to visit um, a place very near the prison. Um, and there's an open air prison near Millam. Um, and we used to visit this um, locality and we used to uh, have to park the car up and we used to have to cross the road and then the railway track and we used to go and see these wonderful stone circle sites. They were very small stone circle sites indeed. Not all stone circle sites are the diameter of the likes of Stonehenge or Avebury. But I feel that stone circle sites have got a really nice sense of an enigma about them. And that sense of an enigma comes in with this following statement by Aubrey Burl. Now, anyone who knows anything about prehistory, anyone who's, who's looked at stone circles, will have come across the name Aubrey Burl. And he wrote of this site that is the loveliest of all the stone circles in the whole of Britain, which, to be honest with you, is, is quite a statement. But you look at it and you think, actually, these stones are, are quite cute. There's an arrangement of these stones, a much clearer image. And it's almost as if there are stones all sorts of sizes. Now, one point I would like to make of these stones and of the, all of these stone circles is that whenever you look at stone circles across Britain, they always make the remark, there was more stones here at one point. 
and this is no such exception. This stone circle once had 60 stones in a circumference. Um, and this, this site itself um, is of um, 27 meters in diameter. So if you compare this with the site that we will be looking at in a few moments, um, the Ring of Brodga, which is 104 meters in diameter, this is almost a wee little one. But some of the other ones I used to visit in Cumbria were, you know, five, 10 meters in diameter. So this is not like middle of the way. Um, so it, it was recorded that there was once 60 stones at this site and they're all shapes and sizes. And there's only 55 here. And because we're limited with time tonight, I can't go in into all the detail associated with all these stone circle sites. It would be madness. But the one thing about these Wednesday evenings is to have a little bit of an enjoyable exploration of different parts of Britain. And I'm achieving that, which is which is great. Now, by looking at this quickly, you can see that this is sort of within a natural um, amphitheater uh, with the sort of hills and all these other um, ranges around them. Um, and when me and Bill and Pat were in the presence of the great Dr. Martin Carruthers from Orkney University, um, the University of Highlands and Islands, um, he, he said one, one important thing that's lived with me and Bill in particularly, that each of these stones in front of us could actually represent family. Um, and it's one of those, one of those things that um, some archaeologists like myself believe that uh, when, a, uh, when people want to commune um, and get a sense of connectedness in the landscape, because most of these monuments date back to five, um, 5,000 years ago, so it's quite some time in history. Um, and the ones up north are older than the ones down the south, so that's another statement to make. Um, so, and inevitably, there's always different numbers of stones in a circle site, um, except that most of the ones in Cornwall seem to have the number nine, you know, the, the, um, uh, the nine Merry Maidens or the 19 Merry Maidens or something or other, right? So, but this, this one having 60 stones is actually, weirdly enough, enough comparable uh, with the Ring of Brodga, which we'll, which we'll have a look at in, in Cornwall. So, and, and the other thing about these stones, as uh, me and Bill experienced, I experienced a lot of things with Bill actually, but when we went to a wonderful stone circle, another um, stone circle, uh, um, Boss Cowan uh, in Cornwall, which we visited very recently, um, it's almost as if, um, you know, the stones are not all the same. They're not all the same types of stones. You're going to get um, hev heavily quartzite type stones. You're going to have sandstones. You're going to have um, limestones. You can have granite stones. You can have glacial stones. Um, um, lots of stones for these types of circle sites are actually being um, made available via glaciation. Um, and it's always the story with stone circles. Well, I'll tell you one of the stories now that um, if you if you try to count these stones, you'll probably come up with a different number every time. Um, and that's because what are you what are you including when you're counting? Are you including um, all the stones standing? Um, are you including the standing stones um, and the ones um, uh, re recumbent um, ones, uh, cumbent, what, what ones you're looking at? Are you including little stones like that, packing stones? Um, other people have different ways of looking at these stones and uh, different interpretations. So you could think that this stone circle itself has been created because um, it, it's associated with nicely decorated stones. Um, and lots of the stone circles in the likes of Cumbria are, are of old sandstones, um, but obviously stones in Cornwall are inevitably um, of, of different um, of different types. Um, so there's no rules with these stone circles. And, and that's one thing to say uh, at the top here. There's, there's no real rules. 
and you can see that nice little bit, bit of decoration there. And obviously, one of the um, one of the most um, frustrating things, you know, particularly with this site at, at Swineside, um, and I think um, somebody on my trip to Cornwall observed on this. It may have been Michelle or somebody else, and they said, "Why do they have sheep roaming around in these fields?" Uh, because you know they 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 shelter up against the stones and and um, it, it it sort of damages the ground around the stones um, and if anyone's been to Stanton Drew they'll know what I mean and you're continually treading in um, sheep shit and all these other things but then you think about it um, you know this is this is a field it's being looked after by the local farmer and you know the sheep do a good job job grazing around it. Um, and if you've got cattle in a field like this, you know, the cattle might use these stones as back scratchers. Um, so, again, thinking about these stones and their sense of context and meaning. I'm not the type of archaeologist who says that these stones line up on winter or summer solstice. I'm not the type of archaeologist who says that they're an, um, an, uh, a calendar for astronomy. Um, I'm, I'm not in that ilk. OK, because I, I, I like to be those archaeologists that say, you know, this is a stone circle. You know, there's X amount of stones there. There's this diameter. There's, di there's a ditch around it and so on and so on. Um, and you interpret. Um, one of the great things with stone circles is is when you go to them and, and it says the um, antiquarians have moved stones around and, and mucked around with them and, and so on. And one of the experiences that we had when we went to Cornwall was that I was continually saying that antiquarians had been in here, they'd removed stones or they had added stones and so on. But nicely, lots of the ones in, in Cumbria haven't had anyone mucking around with them. Um, and you've got nice, nice, nice levels of lichen on lots of these stones. And again, what did that mean to the ancestors? Well, I've got to make another statement that with these types of stones and you know you get you get some of these stones um, um a, a meter off the ground two meters off the ground just over that um, when you look at the ones when you compare this with the ring of brodga you look at um up to nearly five meters in height amazing enough the ones at avebury for example i wasn't going to mention avebury tonight actually but the ones at avebury um um you know uh, can be um six or seven meters in height and can can be a whopping weight of 40 to 50 tons but let's look at reality um because when you look at stone circles like this they're, they're, they're built by the people for the people and inevitably there's lots of signs of weathering at them and occasionally as we'll see with one example you get um just a stone standing in a field and you think well where are the other stones and you're thinking well you know the other stones, for example, have been removed by farmers. And that's that's the thing with these stone circle sites. They, they are inevitably in the middle of fields. And over the years, farmers have destroyed these stone circles. So check in another fact. We know we've recorded 1,300 stone circle sites in Britain. And off the top of my head, there were probably up to 5,000 at one stage. In the waters around Orkney, we're, we're finding some in the water, you know, and 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 there's, you know, I know 5,000 sounds a lot, but but when you think about lots of these are being cleared, um, you know, you start to think, well, you know, I might have a good point there. And again, you, you look at these sites and not, they don't necessarily, necessarily uh, mean to say that they've always looked like this uh, um, again archaeologists like myself who believe that maybe um particularly in the upland areas these stones were never meant to be seen uh, they were meant to be hidden and you were only meant to see the tops of them um this is in sort of in in a dell um surrounded by um you know this this these this range of trees um were these stones higher at one stage um, well, the answer is yes anyway, because of erosion over 5,000 years, that would have had an effect. Um, when people say that new standing stones are being found, um, simply because, because of erosion, 
in upland areas, um, slowly but surely the stones are being exposed. So this loveliest of all the circles um, in um, prehistoric Britain. And again, looking at the differences, shapes and sizes. And, you know, one quick point mentioned to Avebury. Um, at Avebury, I think they once believed that there was like 90 stones around Avebury at one point. And there's a, a, a toss off load in the middle. There's loads of other stones in the middle, but around the outside, there was about 90 odd stones. But there aren't 90 stones today. And the archeologists say that they were moved somewhere else or they've been destroyed. But when they've excavated into where the stones were, there's no evidence that there was a stone there at all. There's just a socket in the ground. So because there weren't 90 families moving into the Avebury area, there was never a stone placed in that socket. So when archeologists say that there's, there, was, there were 60 stones here, maybe there never was, just because there's an indication of space for another five. Careful, careful on that one. Now, I'm gonna take Bill. Bill, me and Bill are going to go straight down to the Undies, right? And we're going to visit um, Orkney, right? Um, and Bill will remember the day that I went to um, this site um, and the confession. Me and Kathy went there at night and we ran around this stone circle naked. Perfectly natural thing to do. Um, so this site itself, we have now moved to um, the Ring of Brodger. And we know about the Nessa Brodger from, from, you know, television programs. And it's a fascinating landscape. There's the Ring of Stennis. Um, there's the archaeological site at the Ness. There's the um, Ring of Brodger. Um, you've got the, um, you've got the, um, I think the Bachan Mound as well. Um, you've got lots of stuff there. Um, so this is a wonderful site. It, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but the landscapes changed a great, great deal. Um, and if I, if I can sort of give a little bit of orientation with this site, um, this is looking um, southwards. And the, um, the Mound of Buchan's this way. Um, and there's a ditch around it. You've got all these standing stones. And the diameter is 104 meters diameter. And it was believed that there were 60 stones here at one point. And now, my friends, there is only 27. Again, same rule of thumb. As I've said, just because the archaeologists feel that there were 60 stones here, it's not necessarily true. Um, lots of these sites haven't been archaeologically excavated, which, which is a big shame. But then again, in many ways, it's not a bad thing, because if we excavate all these sites, then future generations ain't going to have the information that they require. Now, give you a little bit about the environment, and all these different sites have a little bit of extra information, and this is recorded. And Rosamond, how is it sounding now, babe? Hey, what, what image are you yeah. looking at? I'm looking at the, the stone circle. You are um, a babe. Ring of Brodgar. Yeah, well, yes. uh, yeah, you don't have to be an expert. Nobody likes a swatter, right? Um, anyway. Okay. Um, so the, um, your, your, your grandson loves this because I'm constantly criticising you. But get a bit about the environment, what we do know is in the water, there are other stone circles, right? We know that. So Ooh. this itself is a site um, that was more or less um, within the landscape. And as the water, right, what we know about Orkney is that Orkney was connected to mainland Scotland at one point. It's no longer connected to the mainland Scotland. The answer is the sea level's rising. Don't need to know any more, right? And there's this other thing that, you know, Scotland's still rising after the Ice Age and all that garbage. But anyway, uh, that, this is something else. But um, the, the point is, is that if you, down there, uh, there are the excavations at the Ness of Brodger and sort of over by here, you've got the Ring of Stennis. Strangely enough, I'm doing two sites within sort of um, looking distance. Uh, I know me and Bill have wandered hand in hand down here all the way to the other site. 
um, because it's within walking distance, but it's well worth a walk. And that was there's a little walkway here. Um, but don't wear archaeology company um, hard hats because you get stopped by the um, um, the Kirkwall UNESCO police asking you what you're doing. Um, but also around this site, there are other mounds as well. So this is not just within its own landscape. So this stone circle dates roughly to around 3,000, 2,500 years BC, 5,000 years ago. Um, it's probably a little bit earlier um, or around the same date range as Swineside. Um, you know, when we get to Wales, you know, the, the, the stone circles in Wales and the stone circles in Cornwall, um, and a little bit dates later by about 500, 1,000 years. So, you know, lots of these things are developing in the north. But this is probably the last of the stone circles being built in Orkney. Um, so this is this has got a lot to say for it, a, a, a great deal being the last. Um, and not, the other one didn't have a ditch around it. This has got a ditch around it. So this is a Henge Circle Monument. Uh, this is a, a stone circle with a hen with with a ditch around it. It's basically classed as a henge monument, but for the sake of argument, it's our stone circle. The ditch itself is nine meters wide, um, and the complete circumference of this is a whopping three hundred eighty meters circumference. So you know it'll take you um, a couple of minutes to walk around it. In other words, if you go on the outside and, and walk around it, but if like me, you run around it at night. Um, it doesn't take very long and it's very chilly at night as well. Um, so this this is actually a three meter deep ditch and it get, cuts directly down to the stone. Um, and let's look at a few more images. Uh, we've been looking at this image for, I know Ellen will probably moan as she always does. Um, so again, lots of these nice little views again with the perspective. Um, now, we do know that Orkney was covered in trees once and, and were trees used in the construction of this monument? Well, if they were, not a lot of trees would have been used. The stones for this site would have been quarried very, very locally. The stone here, um, the stones themselves are about 30, um, about 30 to about 40 metres Start again, 30 to 40 centimetres in width, 30 to 40 metres. My God, that would be something. But anyway, 30 to 40 centimetres in width, and they can be up to 4.7 metres in height. Most of them are roughly just over two metres in height, but they are really interesting. They're of all shapes and sizes. Ask me the question, are there any carvings at this site? The answer is yes, but they all date to much later time period. And what we do see with a site like this is that over, year, over the years, um, the patina, the stone flakes off over time. As you can see, this stone is split. Now, we do have references with this site that the stones are so high, they, they stand up over the, you know, I know it's sort of in a bit of a cauldron, um, but on the nest, these stones are some of the highest things on the nest, you know, five, you know, nearly five meters above ground level. So lots of these have actually been hit by lightning strikes. So you can imagine that um, that puts another perspective and meaning onto these sites. We, we've got record records of at least one of these stones in living memory being hit by a lightning strike. And it basically, part of the stone came, part of the stone collapsed. So you start to think if one of these stones is hit by direct, direct lightning every, you know, 10, 20 years, you know, it's going to reduce the height again and cause a great deal of damage to the arrangement. So this one, this is this is the one um, that the stone was hit by lightning. So it's basically completely reduced. But you can get an idea, and and you and you look at these, and these are massive monoliths. That they're, they're huge. They're really impressive. They're all shapes and sizes. And now you think, well. Did this look like this 5,000 years ago? The answer is no. It was thicker, it was taller, it's weathered, and part of the side has come off, probably hit by lightning as well. So, you know, or, or natural faulting. One thing I was going to say is that the local stone itself, as you quarry it, comes off in um, sheets. 
So you undermine it, quarry it, it comes off in sheets. And you can use these then for the construction of monuments. And again, different angles. It doesn't look like it's part of a big stone circle, but it is. Um, and there you go within a landscape. Now, looking at this as well, um, you know, I've said that the, the patina of the stone, layers of the stone come off over time, but you can actually look at this and you actually start to think, hmm, this is rather interesting. And why is this rather interesting? It actually looks like the bark of a tree. Now, it's likely that you know, this has been eroded, but this is within the inside, a, a more or less, you know, more or less away from direct the direct wind. I know the wind can come out from the other side because it's an open circle. If you start to think at Stonehenge, for example, the dreaded Stonehenge, um, you're told that some of the stones um, there uh, were carved to replicate um, the texture of bark on wood. Is that what we're seeing? But there is one thing, is all of these stones are very different shapes and sizes. Um, there's no uniformity to these stones. If you compare this with Stonehenge, yeah, there is uniformity, but you know, Stonehenge is being mucked around with and changed. Again, this site hasn't been truly archaeologically excavated and it's a wonderful, the whole Ness is a, um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so you can't go up there with a metal detector. You will be burnt in hell if you do. Uh, and lots of them look, you know, that even looks like a head, you know, but, um, but you know, it, it's due to the natural erosion that these sites see within the landscape. And again, I've got a couple of these stone circles that have um, snow um, on the ground, for example. And we are now moving on to Cornwall. You know, I could have done, I could have done this, you know, we'll probably do another lecture like this in the future about stone circles to give you a little bit more information, but we're now going to look at a um, site in Cornwall. So we've done Orkney, we've done Cumbria, we're on Cornwall. <coughs> now, weirdly enough, I'm going to say it, there's not many true stone circles in Wales. There's, there's loads of stone circles in Cornwall. There's, there's loads in um, there's loads in Wiltshire and you know Orkney and Cumbria, but there's not as many in in Wales. Um, and one of the facts um, that I probably did mention in Cumbria, in, there's there's at least fifty stone circles, um, and I and I would struggle to find that many in the, many in the whole of Wales, for example. And you get loads in Cornwall. Cornwall's actually quite a big place, really. So we're going to look at this site. This is the site known as the Merry Maidens or Dawn's Men. And you know what? I'm going to go straight to a bit of a, a story about this site. So I've got these on my... Um, so here we go. Hang on a minute. Have you ever, have you ever had one of those days, um, Rosamond, where you've got everything set up and it's not worked out the way you want it to? Yes, most days. All <laughs> uh, right, so you know, I've got a little story I want to read out about the the, the merry maidens. Uh, now, I'm not going to tell anymore. I'm going to show you the images in a minute. So I was telling people a story about this on the bus. So myth and legend: the local myth about the creation of the stones suggests that 19 maidens were turned into stone as punishment for dancing on a Sunday. Um, it basically means the um, the stone dance circle or otherwise known as the dawn's men because obviously at dawn there you go um the there's three other stones nearby on the way to the site there's the two piper stones and there's the fiddler stone so the piper the piper's two megalithic um megalithic stones some distance um, northeast of the circle are said to be the petrified remains of the musicians who enticed the women to dance on a Sunday. How dare they? A more detailed story explains why the Pipers are so far from the Maidens. Apparently, the two Pipers heard the church clock at St. Burren strike midnight, realised they were breaking the Sabbath and started to run up the hill away from the Maidens. Typical man, isn't it? 
The women are dancing in the field quite nicely. The men know that they're in trouble and they run away. Um, so uh, the maidens, um, the ma maidens carried on dancing without a, com a compliment. These petrified um, um, erect pipers are associated with the um, circle. And as obviously uh, the fiddler stone as well, a, a lone fiddler stone. And the other thing as well is, is that um, it might be, um, these stones are associated with um, the battle um, of Howell over Athelstan, um, which was a Cornish battle sometime in the 900s. So I wanted to chuck them in there, right? And the other thing I wanted to mention is that when we were looking at stone stone sites in Cornwall, I would come up with this guy's name, William Borlas, from 1769. Um, and and then I would um, I would talk about um, um, another Borlas, another William Borlas in 1872, different two different individuals. And these two individuals, the Borlasses, both Williams, so you get really confused there, one in 1769, one in 1872. Both of them are excavating um, around Cornwall, right? And they're, they're re-erecting stones and all sorts of things. But one thing that um, William Borlas, um, it's going to be the younger, um, tells us in 1872 is at this site there was another stone circle um, another concentric circle around the outside of seven stones, whereas this stone circle is, is of 19 stones. So there's another stone circle around the outside um, of seven stones, and the stone circle inside is of 19 stones. Now, um, it gets confusing again. I'm not going to get any more because um, your minds are going to start to blow. So this is meant to just be an overview of these sites. So again, um, that gives you an idea of the stones as well and the heights and the merry maidens. And by the way, this gets even more confusion. There are more. There are a number of other maidens in Cornwall. Um, so you, you, you've, you've got the maidens. Um, you've got the nine maidens. You, you haven't got the iron maidens. That's the pop group. But um, but there are other maidens in Cornwall. So if anyone says, let's go and see the, the merry maidens, you've got to you've got to be very careful whether you're going to be visiting this one or not. Now, when Borlas was write, writing in 1872 at the site, he tells us of um, this, an outer circle, and this belongs to an outer circle. There's another one there, and there would have been another seven stones, which have been lost. But if you, like many stone circle sites, when you go to them, um, there's loads of other evidence of other stones which are used in hedgerows and so on. Um, now, the, this itself, near St. Burian, the stones are a maximum of 1.2 meters in height. So um, a little bit lower in sort of perspective than, for example, um, you know, the ones that we've already seen. And, and maybe these stones were meant to be completely covered up at one stage. Who knows? But again, what I'm looking at is Dartmoor and, um, 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 oh God, Dartmoor and the bit, one beginning with a B. Um, um, Bodmin, that's the one. Thank you, Michelle. She's useful sometimes, Michelle. Um, those areas uh, within that landscape of Devon and Cornwall, um, new stone circles are being revealed in upland areas. So those upland areas, the stones were always covered at one stage uh, because of erosion and, and loss of soil and soil creep. The stones are revealed. Anyway, we've already mentioned that. Um, this one is 24 meters in diameter, so it's much smaller than uh, Ring of Brodga. It's smaller than the one at Swine Swineside, but it is a lovely site, I must say. Um, and it's near the road as well. Um, and you can get an idea of the height. And, and the stones are all shapes and sizes, um, which we've already mentioned. Again, a few more images. Look, I, I love it when you look at this. Again, um, 19 stones, it said that there was only originally 18. Now, if you um, think of that, um, if you say, I don't know where, apparently one, one stone was added, whether it was that stone, whether it was that stone, or, and when you think about it, there's a, there's a gap there, a gap for two stones. And nobody said, thank you, Michelle, that there should have been two other stones here. 
and you start to come to what I've already said about, you know, was this meant to be a complete enclosed stone circle? Um, and you've always got to question these things. And you know what, right? And a, and a thing that I used to do with Bill, um, and maybe I should do a lecture like this. I'm going to write, take a note. Um, I, we used to go on walks. Um, and what I used to do, I used to say to Bill and Kathy and Pat, I used to say, we're going to this site and I don't know what we're going to see. There's an X on the map, right? And we're going to visit it. I used to go there with no information. And sometimes you used to learn more from looking at a site with no information than having information. Because you look at this, you think, oh, they're all different shapes and sizes. There's this and that. And what you do find is when you go to Stone Circle sites in the blurb, it says, oh, um, that's clearly um, an alignment. Um, and, and basically there's a gap there and, and, and you're thinking, well, no. Um, in the past, the alignments on certain moons and suns and stars the, the tilt of the earth has changed, all things have altered, right? And what I like to say with these sites is that you can learn so much more about them by just looking rather than you will with a notebook. And when you've got a notebook, you're always going, it, it, what's this And is it in this way and so on. Um, you know, Michelle and I went for a walk this evening um, and um, we don't get out enough. I don't get out enough anymore. And we visited the landscape and we learned more from the landscape than we would have if we'd have taken a map with us, right? And this is what I'm saying with these types of places. And again, if you go to a place um, like this with say, um, Peter with local knowledge, but maybe he's not been to this site, you bring in that local knowledge and you use that local knowledge to interpret the site, it's the same type of thing. Now, this is a red herring and um, it's a red herring because I'm glad Ellen can't speak at this minute, but I took Ellen to see a few monuments um, up near Estrid Valta. Um, and it was a day that there was a rally on the road um, and the road said it was closed. But as I don't like people who um, drive, um, go on their bikes in Lycra, I completely ignored this and I drove directly um, into this rally. Obviously, no, I didn't want to kill anybody. And anyway, we ended up at this site and, and none, of, none of the gang went with me and I knew this site was there. I knew it was 10 kilometers south um, of um, Tritawa. Um, and I knew it was somewhere near Ostradwalta and, and, I, and we were looking for a site that was near um, 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 near the River Towie, ba basically the source of the River Towie. And I thought, right. So I left everybody on the side of the road with Ellen moaning. Um, I love you, Ellen, you know I do. Um, but I found this site and I was bloody disappointed. It's nothing like this at all. Now, what somebody's done, they, they've gone from the ground and it's made these stones look like they're two or three meters tall, right? That one in front is two meters tall, the big one, right? That's known as the Mine Maur, the big stone, Mine, M-A-E-N, Mine Maur. Um, this is known as the Circle of Kerig Duon. Um, and this, they believe that this dates from about 2,000 um, 2, years BC. So it's a thousand years um, newer um, than say, for example, the Cumbrian and Orkney sites, right? Um, and I actually called this stone circle a fake because these stones themselves are no more than a, than, than about 30 uh, to 40 centimeters above the surface. It actually says in my notes um, that um, these stones themselves um, are half a meter in height. They're not. That one in front is two meters height, but uh, and the rest of them aren't. And when I went there, right, I was, it says that there's 20 stones there. Can you see 20 stones? Because I bloody can't. So when you go to these sites, be prepared to be disappointed. Now, um, I, I, I've, I've been to lots of sites and I've had disappointment, but I've been to lots of sites and I've thought, you know, the one site, and, and uh, Michelle's in the background, the one site that I was really disappointed with on the Cornish trip was the uh, Menatol Monument. 
because I expected it to be this huge thing with loads of stones around it. And I was really disappointed. Um, mind you, I really upset this one woman who was just about to crawl through it. Um, and I was all alone with her and a friend in the field. And, and I said, if you crawl through that stone, you'll end up pregnant. And she said, no bloody lightning, you're not getting me pregnant, mate. And she didn't climb through the stone. Um, but the point is, that was the highlight. It was a little bit disappointing looking at a stone circle there, a bit like this one, actually. Um, but with that, we aim to learn. Now, um, it said that this is 18 metres in diameter. Again, it's it's smaller again. I mean, it doesn't have 20. This is, this is actually more like this is what the stones look like. Um, and actually... Um, I'm going to chuck something else in here. It might actually be um, the remains of a Khan. These might be the out, out the stones of a Khan. So I'm very suspicious of this one. Um, and there it is. Um, did I say Trotau? I meant Tricastle. Sorry, Trotau was nearby, actually. There's Tricastle, 10 kilometres south of Tricastle. And that is the big stone. And look at that there. I tell you what, if that's disappointing, that little stone in the forefront, I don't know what is. Um, it it. it it's like spending any night with a woman I've ever spent with. She's always disappointed by things. Um, but that stone is much taller, um, two metres in height. Kerig Tuam, um, the mine mower. Um, and again, I've done a video of this and it's online. And again, you can see how small these stones are. But OK, let's not be negative anymore. I'm sorry I'm negative about this. Side. I'm just telling you of my disappointment. Uh, but there is one thing that this has in... Um, similarity with the Ring of Brodger and um, we've got the one at Swineside and um, not the one at Merry Maidens but this has got similarity with Ring of Brodger in that it's sort of in a bit of a, um, um, a natural amphitheatre it's not in an upper area um, and I'm quite again let's move on let's not say I'm, I'm suspicious of this I'll be repeating myself and, um, and let's try not to be too negative and again, there's that big stone highlighted. Now we're going to, oh, again, this is like all the other sites, except for the Merry Maidens. Can I ask, I, I know Pete, Pete can't reply. Why do the people in Cornwall always have to be different? You know, these all these stone sites that we're looking at are, seem to be a natural sort of amphitheatres overlooked by mountains, but the ones in Cornwall ain't. Why do they have to be different? But anyway, this is a nice site that I've been with um, Pat and... Bill and Peter. This is a site known as Castle Rig. And this site again dates to around 5,000 years ago. Um, this one again, this is different. This, this again has got some different differences in. And it's described that these stones are actually glacial boulders. And I, I really love this site. I've got fond memories. I, I took my um, little son Reuben here. Um, and he, he's he's a um, a little um, chappy cherub. And when I chased him around the stone circle, I said, "Right, Reuben, we're going to count the amount of stones that make up the stone circle." Now the problem is, um, I think we counted thirty-seven, and when I went there with um, Bill and the gang, I think we counted forty, and then the official notice says um, forty. And then you can go around it again, you count 42 stones. Others say 38. And the other thing as well is you don't include these stones here because that's an internal chamber, which is another weird queer thing altogether, right? Which we'll mention a little bit. And, and I've mentioned lots of these stone circles. They've got nothing really inside them. Um, you know, when you compare this with say um, Stonehenge, um, and maybe the Ring of Stennis, which we'll touch upon today. And we're doing pretty well for time, actually. So, um, you know, for the boys who want to watch the football, we will hopefully be finished about um, 22. Um, so the this, again, we've got um, 33 metres in diameter, if anyone's writing any of this down. Um, and for me, what's most important about this site is that in the medieval period, they ploughed around the site, didn't remove the stones, and they revered this site. I like that. It wasn't wantingly destroyed by, um, for example, the church. 
um, it wasn't sort of um, flattened or, or injured in any way, shape or form. Um, and th there's actually there's actually ridge and follow all the way around it. It sort of radiates from the site. It's beautiful. I, I, I took an image of the site, which um, one day I will find. Um, and, it, uh, and, I, and the ridge and furrow with, with the setting of the stones, it looked absolutely beautiful. Lovely image. And I'm, I'm so pleased I've been to this site. So there's Castle Rig there. Um, and again, it's in that type of area that ties in um, with um, the site that we've looked at with um, Ring of Brodker and say Swine Side. And again, this is in Cumbria. And, and I got to mention, I mentioned something different about all these different sites and I'll mention something different again. Um, some people believe that stone circles are created um, to not only remember individual families, each of these stones represents an individual family if you want to believe that, um, but in lots of ways, being that all these are glacial stones, um, the people in the landscape arrange these glacial stones in a circle or, or an egg shape. Um, and no, they're not always circular, but you know, they're sort of oblong and sort of um, quite odd shapes, some of them. Um, and you start to in a way, get more connected with what they're doing. It's it's actually it's actually more practical. Um, obviously, you know, they're using the field for agriculture and so on. Um, it, it's actually a practical thing as well, and that's very rare that people talk about that. And there it is. This isn't my image. Whoever took that is is done this. You got the high ridge, uh, the furrow, the ridge, and the furrow from the medieval period. And they stop at the outside of these stones. It's lovely, isn't it? That they've they've kept the sanctity of another belief structure. Now, do you know what? Sometimes I come up with little gems. And I'm going to chuck this at you. 99% of all archaeologists would disagree with the following statement. This may not have had any religious meaning at all. Um, and maybe the local people in the medieval period knew that. And therefore, they didn't need to destroy it because it wasn't pagan, right? That's an interesting concept, isn't it? If you think about it in a different way, um, and you take away the religion and ritual, and you think about practical, let, let me let me chuck this at you. Um, my sister died in two thousand and six, and she's got a gravestone in the cemetery, and and there's and it's well tended by my parents and my. Um, and my nieces and so on. Um, but that's got no other practical purpose other than a grave marker. Think about think about that. There's a point there. And the point is, is that sometimes we overemphasize the importance to us today, the importance, it was important to them back then. Um, and again, lots of stones sort of recumbent um, and and you see the heights of these stones, the tallest one, as I said, is 2.3 meters in height. Maybe that was two points here. Maybe it was higher um, erosion and all the rest of it, or maybe less of it was exposed in the past. And I, I love it when you get this sort of connection with the landscape. The problem is with the one, the, the Merry Maiden site, and I do like it. Um, that you've got a hedge around it and you lose its um its its relationship with the landscape it loses the intercourse with the pipers and the fiddler um carry it on and there's a little chamber actually within it you you've, you've already mentioned this um i've already mentioned this um so there's the outside of the stone circle and inside there's a rectangular box. It's a very strange thing because you don't find this at most stone circle sites. Some people have referred to this box as a burial chamber or some people have just referred to it as 
it could actually be a shelter for sheep and it was developed it was built you know a thousand years later or it could be something that we don't know i love that i love that in prehistory there's so much that we don't know if um if we wrote down what we actually know about prehistory i think we could write down one percent of what we know you know it's just like um um it's like many things that there's a little bit of information out there but there's not there's not everything you know um, and those people there, they're standing in front of this sort of weird sort of rectangular box thing. Um, and then you've got this wonderful circle. So amazingly enough, folks, um, I've got three sites left. So we've done really, really well tonight. Um, and I haven't had in, any interruption from Rosamond. Um, and again, this is the last view, one of the last views of Castle Rig again. Oh, and, and when you look at these stones, they don't they don't talk to you. Um, they don't talk to you like the stones at Stonehenge because they've been over they've been overvalued. We talk about these wonderful carved stones at Stonehenge, and they mean this and that. But these are all strange shapes and sizes, and they they tell you something else. The 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 connect right. The connectedness of these stones with the people who erected them um, has a different meaning um, than we could um, then give it credit for. And this is a little plan. Um, I've tried so many different ways to sort of show you these sites in different ways. Um, and it's um, what they say as well, um, you know, the usual thing. Um, which I which I disagree with. They say, oh, there's the entrance into the site, definitely. Oh, and we'll chuck another entrance in there, and, we'll, and this is the sanctuary, or oh, we'll have another entrance there, and you're thinking, rubbish. Um, so we we see this site, um, and what I was, just, just a quick point, I'm, I know time's against us, but um, another quick point that, um, you know, if you count these one these taller stones and then you miss out that one, you're going to get a different number. By the way, anyone wanting to know what we're doing next, we're going to do something completely different. We're care we're, we're comparing um, tower castles um, across those four regions next week. Medieval tower castles. We're doing a bit medieval next week. So the, I, I wanted to quickly look at this site. This is a site known as Grey Hill which is in Gwent. I've never been to this site. So this is this is a site that I had, that Bill get to Grey Hill um, in Wentwood. And unfortunately it is in Wentwood Forest. So um, if anyone's gonna go there, they're gonna be very aware that lots of trees around. So uh, again, rather interesting site um, because it's got, um, this site itself is inevitably, there's a bit of a debate. There's, there's one, two, three, four, um, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Right? Um, or do we um, discount that stone and that stone? Um, we just count um, that to make eleven stones, or is that stone part of another monument? And you think about all the sort of implications and meanings and interpretations. Was it an early stone circle or a later stone circle, and so on? Um, and on the outside, there's other stones as well. This, did this represent another stone circle around the outside? We don't know a lot about this site, actually. Um, but I just wanted to mention this is one of the smallest stone circles we've done tonight at 10 metres in diameter. And there it is again. And the other, th oh, yeah. The other thing you've got to be very careful of across the whole of Cymru is that we've had um, the Gorseth. And it used to be that every, um, I think the, I'm sure the gore said is every year or every two years or whenever the gore said goes to a locality, it erects a stone circle, right? Um, and when I was a, when I was a child, I used to think the stone circle um, outside Romney Park in Barry was prehistoric. It was it was erected in 1922. So not all of these stone circles are cross Cymru, and there are others because the Bardic Gore said was celebrated across the whole of Britain, there are other stone circles that are not necessarily prehistoric. And also people putting them up just for the sake of it. 
Uh, this is, an, again, when you do read about these stone circles, um, you've got this outlying monolith um, that projects out to the heavens. And these types of monoliths, two, three, four, five meters in height or whatever they are, um, are never to be linked to these stone circles. Stone circles don't inevitably have just, uh, uh, just by themselves. They're part of a much, much greater landscape. I'm sort of aware that reception probably went a little bit then. So again, this is um, an, an old antiquarian um, plan of this from 1893, um, showing you again um, a portrayal of more than just 11, 13 stones at the site, many more. So we've got one site after this now. We're going to look at um, Stennis. Um, and there it is. This is very near the Ring of Brodga. And look at these. Now, um, I can remember being at this site. Um, and um, whilst we were waiting for Dr. Martin Carruthers, Pat decided to go to sleep on one of the collapsed standing stones. I remember the day well. Don't we, Bill? Um, sorry to embarrass you, Pat. But this is a rather interesting site because we, we these stones are directly as they're cut out of the rock. So about 30 centimeters thickness. Um, and it's not, it's like um, an egg shaped site. It's between 44 meters in length by width of about um, 32 meters. So 44 roughly diameter 32, if you can get a rough there. Um, it's got a rock cut ditch around the outside, so it's sort of a henge monument. The rock cut ditch you can't really see now. Um, and lots of the sites that we've seen have probably got ditches around them as well. Um, they haven't been surveyed. So seven metres wide, so the um, width of the ditch at Ring of Brodgur is nine metres wide. Probably This probably dates um, way back in, in time, probably older than the Ring of Brodgur, probably more like three... 3,000 um, years BC, 5,000 years ago. Some of these stones can be five meters high and originally there were 12 stones. Um, and this is where we learnt about that theory uh, that these stones um, represent um, represent um, individual families. And the arrangement of stones in the middle is really, really strange. So that stone's been broken off. Um, and was this the original arrangement um, saying that there were 12 stones um, maybe around the outside or is it 12 stones in total or was it never completed as a stone circle? But again, we've got earthworks and, and, and stuff around this site, again, indicating um, changes and differences and other meanings um, and placing this site within a, in, in the landscape. You can say it's complete boulder dash that each of these stones represents a family. Um, but I like to think that. Um, I like to always look for another meaning in archaeology um, than the published way. I'm not a rebel. Um, it's always best to question what you're seeing. I'm not questioning the fact that these stones have been there for thousands of years. I'm not questioning that they've been erected by human beings. I'm not questioning that there were other stones here. I'm just um, I'm questioning the meaning. And this is the whole point of these lectures, to compare and question. Um, and, and again, that stone there in the middle has probably been broken off at some time. And they're all different sort of angles and, and, and obviously over time, subsidence. Oh, one thing I've forgotten to mention is when these stones have been settled in the past, they were probably, they're probably a third longer. So you can imagine if the, that stone in front of you is, um, uh, that stone in front of you is five meters high, add another two and a half meters to it, and then you probably get the actual height. And again, more of these stones. You can see the stone on the outside. Um, you can see the um, patina on the outside. Um, and it's, it's, you look at that, it's absolutely fascinating. And when we go on to questions in a short while, everyone keep it really brief. Um, and finally, um, we're going to go to this site. This has actually got a stone 
which is not in the middle. <laughs> it's meant, it looks like. So it sticks up, it projects into the sky, and there's probably one more stones in the middle um, than the one that you actually see in here. This is actually 20, 25 um, meters in diameter, and interestingly enough, 19 stones around the outside. Um, and um, oh God, um, this, we, we had a, we had, there was a sideline looking at, um, um, I think it was uh, worker bees who had a nest in the ground. How, how strange my, my events can be. This is a site known as Boss Cowan in, um, in Cornwall, very near the Merry Maidens. And look at that stone, it's a much of an angle. Was that meant, or was that upright once, or was it always like that, or it's been moved, or we don't know what changes have occurred to these sites over the past few hundred years. And it's it's sort of um, elliptical, I can't say it, oblong, that'll do. Um, and the lips, can't get my words out sometimes. But anyway, um, and the other thing that we noticed was that um, all the other stones are really similar, but there's this stone, which is perfectly square, and there's a hell of a lot of quartz in it. And that stone's thinner, and, and, it, and, and it's rather strange. But again, there's nothing strange in it at all. We're just looking at it from a modern point of view. Oh, there is a map, there it is. Um, Boss Cowan Inn, or Un. And again, that's Boss Cowan as it is. Um, and again, you know, People can argue there's that's where there was um, the entrance. Why do you need an entrance into a stone circle anyway? Um, or there's a stone missing. That's 20 stones. So um, and it's a weird shape. But somebody we had a bit of a discussion on the minibus, I think, that you know, we're starting to get evidence of, you know, um, a stone, a hole in the middle, um, and that's where there would have been a post and they walked out and so on. And clearly what you can see, we get really at the end now, what you can see is all these stones are upright. Um, quickly, you can see all these stones upright, but if you look at this sketch from the beginning of the 1800s, somebody has been in there and re-erected the stones. But that's always been like that. So there you go. Um, and then finally, that is the final image. So what I'm going to do, I want to keep questions very brief um, and looking forward to seeing you all next um, next week for part two when we look at when we go to the medieval period. Don't, don't often do that. So everybody keep your questions very, very brief. Actually, one question each. That's all I'm going to allow now. So um, let's um, uh, Rosamond, you go first. Um, no question, really. Just that it's very captivating, uh, the stone circles. They sort of stand still, don't they, in time and take you to another place in your exactly. imagination. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I would like Pete to next because, um, yes, Pete, go for it. You know, I would love I would love lots of these stone circles in Cornwall to be without oh. hedges around them and to actually be seen in the landscape like these other sites. And that, that's what's lacking. But we love the sites in Cornwall. We really did. Peter. Well, I've been to the ones in Orkney as well, and the ones in Cornwall, and again, the other stand, the standing stones of Karnak, which you must do at some point, mm. because there, there's thousands of stones and in you know avenues, what? and there's, there's, uh, there's sacrificial stones as well. Exactly. Um, uh, so there are other things which could be attributed to these stone circles and it's, and, and wait you were with you were uh, with me at the ring of stains yes. in north at a very a smaller version of karnak yeah uh, uh, so a row of a row of stones for little people thank you for that pete um what about um ellen uh you next and then we'll have pat and then um goff go for it um is there anything in any writings or legends or myths about any of these well i did well, show why they were there or what what they were there for well actually I, I there are myths about all of them but what i wanted to do tonight is just do one myth about the cornish site there's myths about all of these sites and they are very intriguing actually you know all the sites we've done today that's your homework and i, I was going to mention if um i i don't know if anyone I, I said last week to look at stone circles and look at them and if you did thank you very much for that um 
Goff. Yeah, it was a fascinating subject matter and uh, good images. And I thought the aerial photograph of um, the Ring of Brodka, it was so symmetrical, it looked like a birthday cake. Or a giant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I, that, that is really, that's really good, actually. I like that. Um, what about you, Pat? Oh, no questions. Thank you very much. And uh, Billis, and then we'll go to Pam, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah. Um, whenever I go to these uh, circles, Carl, my mind just takes off, like all of us, you know, the meaning. Certainly the stone circles in Orkney are very different from those on mainland Britain because of the geology. In Orkney, they're tall, um, slim, whereas they're more boulder type in the rest of the UK, you know. Um, one observation about the Boscowan, I was chatting to you when we were there. It was a fine day. I was leaning against one of the stones and it was very, very warm. So I wondered whether that was a factor. They obviously appreciated that the sun heated the stones. Yeah. Were the stones used as a healing block, for instance? Some people just do hug. And well, it's one of these things that in my mind. Uh, nothing, everything is up for grabs when it comes to interpretation of these uh, amazing places. Actually, there is an answer to that, right? You could use them as rubbing posts or anything. But the fact of the matter is, over 5,000 years, the, the use and meaning of the stones will have changed would have changed so many times that in fact any interpretation is going to be right, except that they were used for um, alien landing pads. <laughs> um, no, I, I didn't do that. <laughs> and fi fi finally, Pam, you you next, and then we'll all um, go off and watch the football. So go on, Pam. Just observations, really. Make um, it quick. Okay, it's going to be quick. Entrance says, instead of them being stone circles, could there have been buildings? And the other one, um, oh. especially if it's egg shaped, birth fertility, especially if there's long, one long big stone like there is at Merivale on Dartmoor. The, the answer, it. the. No, there's that, no answer. No answer, is there? That, no, the. the, the the, the, the answer to that is that, is that there's so many interpretations. And um, yeah, yeah. what was the first thing you said? Because I wanted to say something about that. Oh, yeah. Um, people are saying about entrance stairs. Ah, uh, right, yes. Could yeah. they have been used as buildings? Could they have been? Right, two, two points here, fine here, and we'll call it a day. Um, they, they used to do reconstruction <laughs> of Stonehenge as being a building, like a house, right? Mm. But there's no real evidence for that because, you know, uh, but that's something else. And the other thing as well is, um, in my interpretation, um, from my own sort of um, religious inclinations, um, that the whole point of the stones is to sort of, um, if you've got several stone circles radiating out, if you're on the outside of the stone circle, it's difficult to see what's going on inside. Um, so in a way, it, it's a progression um, through and the gaps in between the stones to get to the middle. And if you look at the interpretation for Woodhenge, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but on that, on that note, if nobody else has got anything else to say, I will see you tomorrow. Um, uh, very, very many thanks um, for um, being with me to, today. This is being recorded. So uh, I'm gonna say good night to everybody now. So night night, Rosamond, Ellen, Peter, good Bill, night. Pam, Pat Hello. and Goff, and if anyone wants to reach out at the end, then they can. Night. No, no, folks. Good night, all. Good night. 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 Good night.